Anyone ever look at an infant when they're first born? Where are they looking? Everywhere. They're looking everywhere. They're spherical. The minute that we start to be able to think and, and interface and cognize, this little spherical being says to, to, says to dad, I just want to be helpful, right? Does anyone remember? I just want to be helpful. So we say to mom, I just want to be helpful, right? And so dad and mom, mom in Canada, mom in America, dad says, oh, you want to be helpful? Piece of cake. We're going to take that little spherical intention that you've got and hone it down into a single tunnel of how you can be helpful. In other words, when I said to dad, I want to be helpful, he thought I meant helpful to him and his particular psychodrama. And so suddenly, the spherical intention of being helpful, the little child shall lead them, is now that spherical, that spherical uh, field collapses into this is how you interface, right? If you want to be helpful to dad, this is how you do it. Right? Well, this is, you want to be helpful to mom, this is how you do it. So if I, you know, I said to dad, I just want to be helpful. Right? He says, oh, that's great. Piece of cake. The, you want to be helpful? Don't make any noise. Don't get in the, in the way of anything. Just stay over there and be quiet. Right? And so I'm invisible. You can't see me. Uh, and so with mom, it's like, oh, yes, you want to be helpful? Well, then just be my shining star. You know, to be this this larger than life character. Uh, as I said, I spoke. I, I could could speak quite young, right? And so my mom would dress me up in a little suit and and uh, and put me up on the uh, the uh, the um, table in the booth at the our local cafe, and I would sing. You know, I, I have uh, Leo Rising, right? I have Leo Rising. I don't know if you guys know what that means. And so th there's all these stories of me just as this little tiny guy with a little suit. And they, I actually have a photograph of it, you know. And, and I would uh, sing, I'm a little teapot. Uh, Rotten Robert. Rotten Robert is my uncle. That's his nickname, Rotten Robert. And so you wouldn't know it was his nickname because everybody calls him Rotten Robert. And I wonder how he got that nickname. Hmm. Well, so Rotten Robert, he, every time he would get loaded on whatever uh, particular medication, he would come up to me and he'd say, you know, do a little teapot for us. And so, <laughs> so you know, um, he was the youngest uh, son of a large family, and he was the pet of my dad's family. So he's the youngest of, of my mom's family and the pet of my dad's family. And so suddenly a grandchild is born to both families and he's now so so rotten had some trouble with that but anyways and so so the key here is that that i was shown that 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 this is a legitimate way to part this veil by finding out how it is that we are in a habitual limitation based on this deal we cut with our parents so that we would behave in a certain way to, and be helpful in a certain way for the rest of our lives, sacrificing our spherical ability into these two patterns of superiority and or inferiority, right? So if I act from my dad's position, I'm superior. I walk around going, and my dad had it really simple. Do what I say, I punch you in the mouth, right? Dad was a pretty serious character. You know, he was, uh, my, my father is Native American. And so, uh, and it was a pretty rough place for, for somebody like that. And, and he was alcoholic, and he died actually of cirrhosis. And so, uh, whereas my mom is just this, I don't know how else to describe her as just the most wonderful sort of, uh, mother that you could kind of ask for, you know, just, you know, just long term, long haul, whatever, but also with an expectation that you're going to be the next baby Jesus. So, 
So, you know, it's a little bit tricky because that would make her Mother Mary. But, and, so, uh, and so the point here is that, <clears throat> that it, it really is the methodology of man know thyself, meaning know your limitation. And from that limitation, set it aside and know thyself as God. Okay? That's, that's where that goes. And so that particular methodology is uh, one that is uh, there for us. And, so, and it's legitimate. So the jarhead one is legitimate because if you get hit in the head by lightning or you have a heart attack or you die in your crib of crib death, it, it knocks you out of your egg. And for a minute, that veil parts. And then you come out and you have this experience. And the problem is that people who have this, that when they go back into their body, that veil closes again. And there's a tendency to interpret everything through the pattern of self-deception that you've got, right? So there's a lot of people who have had near-death experience and immediately take that, that spherical glyph that's a, that basically is a three-dimensional uh, experience and then unwrap it and run it through their carnal mind interpretation. So uh, if you have somebody who's a Hindu who has second death, their, their system will, will boot it up as, a, a, as meeting Vishnu or, or Lakshmi or whoever. If they're a Buddhist, they'll bump into you know, Kuan Yin, or if they're Christian, they'll meet Jesus or whatever. And so, so it's tricky business because you actually have to be an old enough soul that if you pop out and you are cognitively aware that you don't, when you come back in and the veil closes again, that you don't literally project an orthodoxy onto the experience. And, uh, and, and, you know, and, and regardless of, of the fact that some people have done that, uh, the experience, when, when a person telegraphs it, like Betty Eady, right, she, to a certain extent, uh, defined her through her, Catholic, her, her event through her Catholicism. But it's a tremendous uh, book regardless. And, and by the way, if, if, if my best friend, uh, my best buddy Dan, who was an altar boy and a Catholic, hadn't been there, I might not even be here. You know, I mean, Catholicism saved, saved me. And so, and it was my start, right? And my buddy Dan, he goes, he goes, you won't believe. He says, he says, come on, let's go up in the loft. I got to tell you what the priest told us today in catechism. And he said, get this. He said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And so, you know, I'm like five and I'm like... Kaching that slips into my head, and he said it with such earnestness. He was six, and I'm five, and 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 he's like, "Do unto others as you would have them do unto you." And I was just kaching. That was it. I mean, you got it. And so, <clears throat> and so that worked for us for a long time until we found out when we were reading the local newspaper that he and I are both Aries, right? And so we read in there Aries and the quality of Aries. And so suddenly we went from being very good boys who were very helpful to, hey, we're both Aries. That gives us a right to stick our boot up somebody's anyways. And so we, were, we became difficult at that moment. And we blamed it on the bossa nova, of course. And so the point here is that, <clears throat> that, that we find out our limitation to, to get rid of it. That's, that's the point. And that's a legitimate pathway, and, and uh, we have been given this uh, in the previous 25,800 year cycle that we just went through, that we can do it through action, right action, which is karma yoga, union with God through action, or we can do it through the pathway of, of uh, yana yoga, or union with God through wisdom, or we can do it through bhakti yoga, which is union with God through devotion or love. And these three are valid. But what I was given as, as this, this, in this time was that, that there was going to be this, this massive awakening and that, and that we have to be able in this time that's coming to, to be able to 
have a, what's the word, rapprochement. What is that? What does that mean? Coming together. Coming together, rapprochement. Uh, coming together with each type that we have to have that pathway pattern in us so that we don't have an antithetical response to somebody that God's going to send to us because they're not walking the particular pathway of union of, with God that we have a habituated history with from past lives, that we have to have all three of these cylinders firing so that, 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 that the flock that will come to the shepherd who's coming upon us which is our own Holy Christ self and sponsoring master, that we don't have a sour note for those who simply represent our lowest plume and the way that we do not believe is proper for union with God because it's our lowest plume and we've had pain there. And, and the truth is, and, and, and I was going to say that earlier and I was like, well, whatever, um, is this, is that when we start to raise our lowest plume, Right in our threefold flame, when because we're working out the various aspects of our psychology and 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 so if our lowest plume is is the blue plume, <clears throat> then what happens is that we raise that plume up by holding strong our tallest plume. So for me, my blue plume is my lower plume. I have a tall pink plume. My secondary is yellow. So I have to hold strong to that pink plume and do things with love, and then bring this thing up. But when I bring up the, the blue plume, an extraordinary thing occurs, that that blue plume is held basically, as uh, Trez said, because of things we've done down. But it's also true that if you bring up your lower plume, all of the stuff that's in the repression of that plume will start to act through you in that moment, right? You start to have the thoughts and the feelings that are so very powerful and they go back, they go out to this cocoon and feed right back to us. And, and literally we're going, okay, so I'm going to bring up this lower plume, but the minute I do that, I behave worse than if I just stay in my core competency in my tall plume. And plus, because people are watching me and people are looking to me to have some answers if I goof up. So I have no, I, I, I have to stay strong and people are watching, I'm supposed to be a shepherd. And so it's a very difficult sort of thing to be able to, to discharge this energy that seems to be our thoughts and feelings when it comes up as a result of activating that lower plume and to have it so that when we misbehave and people see us, that we discharge it as a humbling rather than a humiliation, no matter what the people say, no matter what is happening out there as a result of us goofing up, right? We say to ourselves, humiliation comes from pride. Pride comes from the fallen angels. Humbling comes from Christ. Christ said, in through my great weakness, I can do nothing. Through, through my great weakness comes my great strength, for I know I can do nothing but through the Father who has sent me. Right? And so, so it's very important for us to know the difference between humiliation and, and, and being humble or humility. And one originates from pride, does not come from God. Humiliation does not come from God. To be humble and to have humility comes from the presence of Christ. And so the only way that we can actually do that is to, uh, is to be in this place of impersonal impersonality, to be the loving father. And that's where all of this other part of this teaching came, where, where one way or the other, yes, we have to face these aspects of ourselves, and yes, we have to literally face the antithetical aspect of the misuse of the Godhead that we've had in our past lives. We have to face those things. And when they come up, they grab a hold of us, and, the, and we have thoughts and feelings that precipitate actions that make us look like we are bad people. 